Hello, St. Luke's. Well, I'm coming from home, but not my home today. I'm in Illinois celebrating my mother's 91st birthday and staying at my brother and sister-in-law's house. And so, well, just an extension of St. Luke's at home. Now, this Sunday is going to be Good Shepherd Sunday. Why? Because our gospel lesson talks about the Good Shepherd, Jesus as the Good Shepherd. And our colic for this Sunday mirrors that image. And it's one we've all heard before. Uh, I'm going to wait till the gospel lesson to talk about Jesus as the Good Shepherd more, but I think the primary message in our prayer for this Sunday is the reminder that God knows each one of us. Just as the Good Shepherd knows each of his sheep, God knows each one of us. And I think it's important for us to think about the fact that we like to keep, it's tempting to think of God in terms of the whole creation, God of the universe, everything that was and is and is to come and that Jesus is the savior of the whole world. And those are important images, don't get me wrong. But if we keep our Lord just really big and powerful and mighty and well beyond us, a God who is out there somewhere, a Lord who will return someday, then we, don't, we can avoid thinking about Jesus as someone who actually knows each one of us. But as Rich reminds us regularly, Christ does know and care about us. Just as the shepherd knows his sheep, Christ knows and loves you and me, and he even knows our names. And so as we're praying this Sunday, I want you to remember that as you pray to God, God is hearing you, God loves you, and God knows each one of us by name. So let us offer the colic for Good Shepherd Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Easter. O oh God, whose son Jesus is the good shepherd of your people, Grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads us, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Acts. Those who had been baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, our first reading for this Sunday comes from the book of Acts. And you'll remember that during the season of Easter, we don't necessarily have a reading from the Old Testament. Instead, we read from Acts in one of the epistles. And the story in Acts continues Luke's gospel. And, well, it tells us the story of the early church. And we've just finished several readings from Acts on um, centered around a sermon that Peter preached after the day of Pentecost. And now we're more into kind of what how the early church worked. And that's what our first reading this Sunday deals with. Now, this week, my brother and I are traveling the back roads of Kentucky. That's right. We're leaving Illinois today. And we're going to drive to Bowling Green, Kentucky. And it's where we spent a few years of our lives growing up. We also spent a significant time of our young growing up years in Georgetown, Kentucky, up in the heart of the bluegrass, just northeast of Lexington. And well, another place we're going to visit on this trip is Shakertown. It's one of the places we visited often when we were growing up. And the Shakers were a Christian utopian society who lived in community and shared everything. They were an offshoot of the Quakers. Now, they were called the Shakers because, well, in their worship, they had a good bit of rhythmic dancing is the only way I can describe it. All together, they would have different kinds of, um, well, it involved a lot of stomping. And it was said that in a shaker worship service, you could feel, literally feel the earth move for miles around. I don't know if that was the case, but in some of the, the, the recordings of reenactments of the worship, it was, it was very interesting. And well, our, gospel, our reading from Acts today mirrors this kind of shaker worship. In fact, that's where they, the whole shaker way of life is uh, an image of this reading from Acts. They lived together. They ate together. They prayed together. It was Christian community. 
Well, now, ultimately, the Shakers um, first got very large. They had a number of communities in the United States, and then it began to die away. A major part of the problem was is that men and women lived separately, and as times changed, as people grew up, you know, the cities grew, the Shakers had found it more and more difficult to recruit people to come and live in one of their communities. Families joining the Shakers were often split apart. Children were even raised by the community rather than their parents, who were also required to live in separate buildings. There wasn't much chance for survival. Now, fortunately, the early Christians did not go to that kind of extreme, but instead they cared for one another. And this early Christian church grew and grew so that today you and I are heirs of a faith born out of a Savior and the original 12 disciples. And I think that's an excellent model for us to follow even at St. Luke's, okay? Because you see, when we do things together, worship, sharing Wednesday night supper, when we, uh, when we gather together and for an outreach project, serving others in our community, well, we can really feel a part of the body of Christ. And I think that's so important for us in this day and time when it's easy to become isolated and kind of off to yourself, but rather gathering together and serving God as the people of St. Luke's. Well, that mirrors this whole image that we see in this reading from the book of Acts. And so I want to encourage you not only to hear the lesson to hear the sermon this week, but to also make that kind of Easter resolution. You can do this. I mean, Lent is not just a time to take something on. You can also take something on during Easter. And so I want you to do that, that you'll join together in St. Luke's. Come and teach one of our Sunday school classes for children. I'm telling you, it'll make your whole week. Come and work in Founders Place with um, Susanna Whitsitt and with Susie Caffey and with Ellie Johnson. Again, it'll make your week. And what we'll discover is the joy of Christian community. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the door for him and the shepherd hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep will follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, this Sunday is Good Shepherd Sunday, as I mentioned earlier, and our gospel lesson just really shares with us that whole theme of Jesus as the shepherd of the sheep. But actually, in this, we find out that Jesus is the gatekeeper, and I'll get into that in a few minutes, but there is an awful lot going on in this gospel lesson, and so what I want to do is start with just a few definitions. Now, we've probably all seen a sheep pen or a sheep fold, as it is called, um, on TV, in the movies, maybe you've even seen one in person, and it's an enclosure for keeping sheep safe at night. Now, during the daytime, different, sh different herders would have their flocks of sheep out on the hillside outside of Jerusalem, and as Rich and I have shared with you before, the countryside outside of Jerusalem is, well, closer to what we think of as a desert, but there were patches of grass where the sheep could go and graze, but then at night, they would bring all the flocks together into one pen, and well, one of the most important people in this was the gatekeeper. And we see in this passage that Jesus is referred to as the gatekeeper of the sheep. And this was because there was always the threat of robbers coming to steal the sheep. There was also the threat of wild beasts that would attack the sheep. 
And so if you bring them all together in one pen, then the gatekeeper could guard the sheep, could protect the sheep, and if robbers or wild beasts came, the gatekeeper would raise the alarm and everybody would wake up and they would protect the flocks. Now in the morning, each shepherd would call his sheep. And as the passage tells us, the sheep literally would recognize uh, the voice of the sheep herder. And well, I heard the story the other day from someone, uh, from another minister, about how they raised sheep uh, when they were growing up. And their parents had a sheep farm and she said, literally, sheep will recognize your voice. Well, when you hear this passage, I want you to remember that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, all right? We come to know God through Christ. And when we follow Christ, well, we can't help but come to know God more and more each and every day. And I think this is the way that we come to know what it means to follow the truth and to inherit eternal life. You know, to follow anyone else is to follow a way that is not the truth, all right? The thief and the bandit are interested only in what they can get for themselves, all right? That's the way the world today is often going to stress that we're supposed to live only for ourselves. What's best for me obviously must be best for me because I know what's best for me. And well, if it's best for me, then it should be good for the whole world. We hear way too much of that. It's all, a, that's the philosophy I say, it's the all about me philosophy. Well, the Christian message is just the opposite. The Christian message is, is that Christ has called us to follow and to follow the good shepherd. And then it's not all about me. Instead, that's the exact opposite of the Christian message because when we live in eternal life now, which is always uh, what we're called to do, yes, we even get a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven now on this earth, when we love God and love our neighbor. You know, people say all the time, how does God want me to live? What's God's will for my life? It's very simple. Love God, love your neighbor. The next day, start all over again. Love God, love your neighbor. And when we do that, Christ leads us. And well, you can hear that still small voice and hear that God calling you to reach out to that person in need, to send that card to someone who needs to know that you care for them, to share God's love, then it's not all about me. It's about me as part of the Christian community and as someone who is continually listening for God. And well, that's a much better way of living. I know I still get back to where it's all about me, but each time I do that, if I will listen to God, as Rich said in his sermon not too long ago, if we will listen for God, God is always faithful. God's always speaking to us. God's always leading us. And it is Christ who shows us the way. So I look forward to seeing you in church this Sunday.